a super expert. I, I often, you know, it's funny, a lot of the junior faculty here, they say they like listening to me speak because I'm actually pretty terrible at getting things published and they actually can relate to me versus like people who just naturally have been good at publishing and um, getting their ideas off from the get-go. And um, I, I, I try and use that uh, to try and encourage people who've had similarly just difficulty in getting started. So that's my preface. I'm not at all saying I am an NIH funded researcher. What I'm trying to do is do relatable things for people who are clinically busy or clinically starting out and uh, they just don't know where to start. So. Um, this is kind of it. So it, it has like 10 points, which is um, the idea and has it been done before? And, um, you know, th that's, that's a, you could spend the entire thing on the idea and people get mad at people stealing their ideas. And I remember Vivian Lee, um, she used to pull us all into her room when we were just starting out. And she said, you know what? Nobody owns an idea. The person who publishes first wins. And actually that's, stuck with me over time because it's it's harsh, but it's really true. And so for people, and this is actually at the seat of a lot of things that make radiologists really mad, is like, oh, I presented that data. That was my idea. I know that person stole from me. But the problem is, is like, the, there's numerous things around that, which is a lot of people have a lot of good ideas at the same time. Two, most people never remember where they got their idea, and it very well could have been your idea but you have to be savvy enough to not share it if you're not about to publish. And so those are, those are all small things. Um, all right, so then I'm gonna get into has it been done the radiology literature? How do you gather cases? I'm gonna go through some of our case gathering methods and I'm just gonna show you what they rely on so you could work with your administration and IT to reconfigure your EPIC to do the same thing. Um, and then I was gonna go through study design, aims, methods, obstacles, and kind of, um, how you should set things up to make your stats easier with one lesion, one patient, so you don't have to do Bonferroni corrections or generalized estimating equations or things that are hard. And then kind of like, how do you go through and start um, doing your research, um, database readers, and then getting your figures and everything out and how anal you have to be. So, um, and because my email just keeps bing binging, I'm going to get out of it. Let me see if I can if I can get out of that because it's in the background and it's annoying. I actually don't even remember which window I have it open in. I'll find it later. I guess we'll deal with the binging for now. So anyways, um, it, to start like for the idea, is there some question that you frequently encounter that you want to answer? And this is what a lot of junior um, radiologists often ask me, which is, how do you actually find the question you want to investigate? And so you have to, uh, either you have to have a breadth of experience knowing that people are generally bad at doing something, or you have to have a good grasp of the current literature. And so, you know, is there a patient population? We do a poor job providing imaging correlates of disease, like in endometriosis, for example, or in bowel closed loop obstructions. We know we overcall them. And we also know that we don't always pick up like peritoneal carcinomatosis. So you say, oh, this is interesting. I wonder, could we do a better job? Is there an artifact or sequence that could be improved? And a lot of people like to do new, you know, grasp advanced radial vibe, and you can image a few patients and do that. And now what a lot of people are doing is surveys. And so is there a question you'd like to do a survey research study on? Um, and so, when you are still new, how do you know what these interesting questions are? So you really have to go to your current literature and go to the annual meetings, see what people are presenting on, and then see what people in the audience ask us questions for what's still unknown and what where you see people coming up short. And then here it's like go to the each journal website and you sign up to have their newly released articles go to your inbox. So like what I did, I remember after my fellowship, and I think you know, um, Neil or Yvonne may have taught me to do this. Is that it? Oh yeah, that's it, so I can close that. Um, I went, so here's radiology, right? And so you can go up and then here it says email alerts, right? And so you say, oh, I'm gonna put in my email, I'm gonna say what I want emailed to mine, and you sign up. Every single site has this. So it's, it's actually very easy. So I just did it for 
NIH. Um, I did it for, you know, Lancet. I did it for the New England Journal of Medicine. And so every month you get an email with the table of contents. And so you just scroll through it and you focus on your area and you say, you know what, this is interesting. And then, you know, the nice thing about radiology now is each of the articles that's heavy hitting, they tap their review board to do an editorial on. So when you click on the editorial, it often will tell you like, what, what's so great about this? Why did this guy think this was an important paper? And he says, you know, and it usually says what, you know, future studies need to be done to look at this and evaluate it, both of which could understand. So you say, okay, this is a gap. Do I have the tools to investigate this? And can I do this better? And so by keep reading and you read these editorials by these, you know, people who are experts in the field, you say, you know what, that's where this needs work. Does my institution have a lot of this? Do I, am I prepared to actually answer this? Like, for example, at NYU, what do we get a lot of? We get a lot of renal referrals. We get a lot of plastic surgery face transplants because that's our center. We get a lot, do we have as many liver transplants? No. So I'm not going to start doing a ton of liver transplant research because I'm going to be, uh, my hands are going to be tied by that. Um, you know, and so you have to work with what you do. And if you don't have it, but you know there's a population that you can do it, like I started um, trying to get people to refer for endometriosis many about 10 years ago, and I kept encouraging the image, and eventually now we built that volume. So anyways, that, that's, what, that's how you start to say what are the interesting questions. You start reading it, you read the editorials, you read the end of the article and what they say future directions are, and you see if you have the tools to answer it. This is just, again, honing back to this idea thing because I mentor a lot of our junior residents and this comes up nonstop. And the other thing that comes up nonstop is people wanting to be first author or last author on things and fighting over authorship before there's even a paper. And I speak from personal experience that, you know, I felt like when I was in my training and young and coming up, that people were fighting, uh, that, that I wanted to be the, um, I, uh, someone told me you need to have all these first author publications. And if you squabble over it too much, people don't wanna work with you. And so finally, I, I've, like, I started realizing, you know what, the project just needs to get done and then we will, you know, then I can start squabbling over it. But if you are too hung up on authorship from the beginning, a lot of times the paper won't even get published. I'm not. Well, I have a say, question there because I've yeah. kind of had a different philosophy where I've thought it's more helpful to be really clear up front who's going to be the first or second or last author so that it's not like no, a no. bunch of people do an equal amount of work and then the squabbling starts. No, no, you're you're absolutely right in that. I guess what I was trying to say, like, is so there's two 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 things. One, if you're doing some small like study at your own institution and it's only your single institution and you're working with people, absolutely clarify what the authorship is going to be before people put in their effort. If you are doing things like DFP research and a bunch of sites are involved and you want to start fighting over authorship, then that's not going to work and you're going to make your collaborators upset. Um, so yes, I, thank you, RT. I should clarify. I always, and you know, I generally, I do tend to be a softy with my um, people that work under me and I tend to give away first authorships more than probably I should have for my career. But I also realized that, um, you know, it's, you've got only like what you've got your first 10 years and it's like even I think it's eight for NIH to be considered young and a junior researcher to be able to go up for any um, a, like a young junior investigator which gets you priority on NIH grants and I'm out of that window so I you know I've stopped caring as much as I used to and now I just care about getting things out but a, a flip side of that is one of the pitfalls I used to fall into throughout my career early on was I would do a ton of data gathering. And like most residents and med students, you think if you do all that data gathering because it's tedious and hard work that you deserve to be first author. And the bottom line is nobody cares about the sucker that does all of the data gathering. It does not guarantee authorship. The much harder part is being the person who synthesizes all of that and puts it on paper. And that is a huge myth that so many junior people 
think should grant them authorship. And they always get very mad and harbor extreme grudges when they've done a tedious amount of data gathering and they're not given first authorship. And so the, and how do you avoid that? After a while, you just need to learn how to write papers on your own. And so that's where we're back to this. So the general idea is if you've thought of an idea, other people have generally thought of it too. And you know, if you were to pull people at a meeting after a presentation, like 10 people have the same idea for doing a project after it. So before you think you've come up with this great idea, you need to do a thorough literature search. And even if someone else has published on it, it may be useful to repeat. So like, was it only done in the pathology literature? Let's say um, pathologists have discovered a new immunomarker that they think correlates with a certain subtype of renal cell carcinoma. But if it's only in the pathology literature, you could say, you know what, AJR loves these rad path correlations. How many do I have? Are my pathologists doing it? Can I do a review here? Um, and if it's only in the path literature, that's worthwhile because then you can do it in a radiology journal. Um, and sometimes, let's say you do a whole project and then you realize it's in every single possible radiology journal. And you can then say, you know what, maybe I'll do it in clinical. Like maybe I can put a spin. You'll have to get more clinical information, but you can put a spin on it. I actually firmly believe that there's so many journals out now that you can get anything published, but you just have to be willing to resubmit it. And so was your design limited? So yeah, if someone else published on it, do you think you can do a better job? Do you disagree with them? Do they have less patience than you're gonna do? How are you gonna sell it that it's worth it to this editor? And has the technology improved? Is it an old idea like bold, um, blood oxygen level dependent imaging? Nobody likes bold imaging. It never worked. It's like, and so are you gonna be the person to revive it because we finally have a seven Tesla and we can do decent imaging with it? So you might consider it then. All right, so 1B, you need to really do a legitimate literature search and you have to learn to cast a wide net. And so these are good ones. Um, and I know like Neil always taught us to do Google Scholar. And so the Google Scholar, right, you stand on the shoulders of giants. So you just do Google um, Scholar and you, you click on it and then you can go and just see who, and it'll give you a number of ideas. The nice thing with Google Scholar is it often gives you um, a different set of uh, papers than, um, you know, let's do endometriosis and, you know, cancer risk, something like that. And you say, oh, MR, and you want to look up MR imaging. It gives you a nice setting and it tells you by cited, which are the heavily cited articles and how recently it was done. And so you say, oh, look, the last of this and this, uh, and this is actually, this is not what I'm looking for. These are all actually erroneously pulled. So I'm not seeing too much of endometriosis and cancer, and I'm certainly not seeing it heavily cited and in the radiology journal. So let's say I have a ton of those cases. I might say, huh, this is an opportunity for me. And so the other one that's an interesting one is mesh on demand, which I, I put on this. This is a good one if you guys review articles. And there's actually an article out this month in radiology where Bloom Key, um, it's in just this month, or it was recent, I think it's this month. It is, how do you write a great review for radiology? And he recommends going to this mesh on demand to look at prior literature. So you can just copy and paste any part of the study in here, and it will give you the relevant top research done in that. So that's actually a really nice thing to use to kind of get quickly up on where are people, was this published, you know, where is the current thinking on this? All right, so then, and then the other one, of course, is PubMed. And so PubMed, every, it's really, everyone loves it. You can get a lot of data quickly um, and you can search. There's other search engines like Scopus and, um, and a wider breadth that you can get more, um, more recent articles. But um, this is like, again, this is very powerful. There's a lot of advanced searches. Again, it sends you to that mesh database that you can search. And then it has like new articles that it kind of um, goes through. Okay. So that, that is kind of, you want to really do a legitimate literature search and search through all of that and try and see where everything is. Okay. So tools for a thorough literature search. You should, I don't, if, if you have a librarian at your institution that helps, we do, that that's super helpful. Find the articles by doing the PubMed. I also love to go to up to date. Um, because radiologists are terrible at clinical medicine, I've found in general. 
And so things that the general medical community is very well aware of, so like here's our up to date. We, we, oh, is it blocking me? That's annoying. I thought I was already, I thought I was already registered. Um, that's so weird. Let me go back. I should be registered to access it. Well, anyways, the nice thing about up to date in general is that you can go and it gives you a nice summary of the current, um, the current where we are with literature. And it gives you a lot of information that clinicians are using um, at the time. I still don't know why it's blocking me on that. I would be able to get it earlier. Yeah, I don't know, it was something weird with it. But here, search up to date. So let me do endometriosis cancer, cancer bit. And so it tells me, okay, here's your endometriosis pathogenesis, here's bladder, and I say, okay, let's click on the top hit. And so when I get it, the nice thing is, it tells me everything about endometriosis, where it is, it tells me the path, I can see, okay, where are these guys from, right? So I click on them, I'm like, oh, you Texas, interesting, this guy's uh, OB guy from Harvard, and this is another Harvard student. So I say, okay, this is, this is their kind of, this is their bias. This is where they're coming from. So I've got an idea of wh what their kind of look is and which parts of the country they come from. Then you go down and you see they go through all of the clinical uh, current literature. And then the other powerful thing is at the end, there's usually so many wonderful references that if you've missed these in your review, this provides you a wonderful starting point to heavy hitting seminal articles, often very old. Like this 1986, this tells me, you know what, this is a seminal article because it's super old and they're still quoting it. And so that gives me a nice, good, quick review of all the relevant history. 1979, this must be one of those heavy hitting papers. This gives you a good bouncing off point. And one thing that, re and, and it will give you a clinical insight into the OB-GYN or your clinicians that you otherwise won't have because we often just don't come with the same history. So that's like a very secretly powerful way for radiologists to suddenly be very clinically intelligent very quickly. Okay. So then you go to check out the library. So, so then again, same vein. We have eBooks that we have from the clinical literature, and you need to get up on that to know where your limitations are. Of course, it's great if you work at interdisciplinary rounds as well, but even for interdisciplinary, you need to read up on their literature to know what they're doing. And then to get the journals, we're very fortunate. We have a very wealthy um, NYU uh, database, and we have access to almost every single journal that exists. And so if I go to my, and I don't know, um, this is not like a show, show off thing. I remember Harvard came to give us grand round one time, and I'm sorry if anyone here is from Harvard, but I wanted to strangle them because all it looked like they were doing was showing off with their system at our, at our grand rounds. And I was like, are you guys going to give this us this software? And they were like, no, we're just showing you what we have access to. But this is nice um, because, you know, we have radiology or any, any area, you, we have access to a lot of full text um, from these journals. The nice thing, though, now is even if you don't have access, um, you can uh, at, at other at other places. You can often just request people send you this data um, from from you know a, a number of these research sites. Okay, so then we go through it and we look for it. And then finally, another good thing to look at is EndNote. And um, you know, I know Neil made us all learn EndNote. RT, you were part of Neil's kind of research thing. I know he loves EndNote. Um, I'm not sure if you guys all have access, but this is, this is really such a great um, kind of tool because you, it, as it's got, gotten better, you can do all of these um, searches as well in EndNote. So for those of you that don't know how to use EndNote, I'm happy to um, send you some of the, um, like how to do it. It's super easy. You essentially just open this library and then now what it's done as it's gone advanced, you can search all of these libraries and then um, you, know, you can add them to your search engine. And from that, you can download the full text. So if I'm gonna do like endometriosis, um, you know, cancer risk and search, um, that's 41 papers, right? So I've got my PubMed that I searched. It'll come up here. 
then I essentially get all of my papers and I can copy and paste them right into my library. So I do it to my um, new library, right? And I'll just say, you know, new library, endo, whatever, endo. And once I get it into that library, which it's copying it into now, sorry, take me a second. So I go to all references. Then what, what's so nice is that now you can actually find the full text, right? So you can search all of these. And if your institution allows you to do that, it searches all of these papers, all of these uh, references immediately, and it finds me the PDF and it puts it next to it. So this actually saves me the full search that I did because I have the paper now um, with it. So I can just open the PDF. I guess it's saying PDF viewer. I, I think it's not letting me open it right now. Where is my PDF? Oh, you know what? It, it probably, here it is. So here's my PDF. Anyway, it's still indexing it, but it puts the full article there. So that's another way to do this research very fast that saves me time. All right, fine. And so then that, that's a quick way to start generating it. So I kind of went through briefly what we have. I'm sure you guys all have your own database searches as well. Um, and you go through that. Okay, so let's go to the next one. I know it seems like I'm only on number two. I can go even quicker, but I'm skipping some of the other things. So it's been done before. Was it only published in the cl clinical literature or was it quality? And you know, you can always do it in a different audience. And so this is old. You can see like now it's, um, up to seven is the uh, is the waiting, but essentially you can go to this site, right? You go to the Impact H Factor site, and then you quickly learn and you search under radiology, and you say, okay, no way I'm getting into radiology. Let's see if I can get into gastrointestinal endoscopy, or can I get into insights into imaging? And it's a very low citation factor, but you know, a publication is a publication. And as you, even if it's in the peer reviewed literature, you're starting to learn about the experience and it's better than nothing. And so you can, you can start getting things out. And, um, and it's essentially like, this is what we do. We just submit something, it gets rejected and we just march down this list as we go. And it, you know, the worst is though, um, and David Bloomkey says it in his paper about how to write a great review. And I think, or actually, I think his, um, his, it was in his second paper, which was the value of peer-reviewed literature. And what was interesting in his value of peer-reviewed literature, which was the second one from this, uh, some, from this month's table of contents, was he talks about the proliferation now of all of these new, um, oh, it skipped me. It's the proliferation of these non-peer reviewed things that you can do. And it's essentially, um, if you, where is it, PDF? If you go through this, you can say, oh, you know, do we need to do it? And he says, PLOS one. Well, the problem is, is you're paying 3,000 to 5,000 per article. That's, it, that, that's not great, but it's even worse if you're gonna publish in these new ones called AIR XIV or Bio R XIV, which apparently he says are paid for through Cornell and other things, um, but he doesn't, it's not gonna count towards your publication. So a promotion. So you can't do, if you're publishing in those lack of peer reviewed, it's not gonna count towards your publication. So you're, you're actually not really helping yourself. It's, it, it's that, that's not, I wouldn't advocate for that. Um, but they will accept pretty much anything you submit. So if you're really desperate and you wanna pay for something, then you could do that. So um, anyway, pick your journal you're aiming for. Pearl, prior articles from that journal. And you can see when you pull those prior articles, like what kind of paper did they accept? How many cases did they use? What was their kind of gold standard? What type of stat analysis did they do? And as you do that more and more, you're gonna learn how to do it. And I, like, I love showing this paper. This was several years ago with Don Mitchell. And he goes through and it, it was such a cute little retrospective review. And it was just saying, you know, angular interface of renal parenchyma for distinguishing benign from malignant lesions. And you can see he just, he only had like 162 masses. And then he just did a two reader retrospective review. And then he did some pretty simple stats. And I'm like, you know what? I have all of these renal mass cases here. I can do two reader retrospective review. 
you know, now I'm pretty sure that wouldn't get into radiology, but, you know, it's still like you look at the current literature and you say, what are they publishing? What is, and you read what the editor writes because Dr. Bloomkey often writes down what he's looking for. He wants now society statements like from SAR and from other heavy hitting organizations that are analyzing a set of like tirads or birads or pirads, looking at their performance and looking how they do that. Am I good at doing a huge multi, you know, institutional review? No. So I'm not going to even bother trying to publish or lead one of those. If that's something you are eventually interested in doing, then clearly you should join those groups that are forming at SABI, at SAR, where they're trying to get people together and teach people how to do multi-site research. Meanwhile, I'm gonna to aim to do little studies like this that I can get under my belt. And so I say, okay, I'm gonna do that. I think I can aim to get that into something. I know AJR still accepts stuff like that all the time. So I'm gonna aim for AJR. So I, I'm gonna gather cases and I'm gonna cast a wide net and now you need to know how you get your cases at your institution. And so again, this goes to your search engine. This is one search engine that we, uh, Joe Sanger at our institution came up with, and it looks like an Atari interface, but I really love it. So let's do endometriosis again. And then he put in, I, I leave that blank, leave body part department, modality blank. And then it says limit to what, and it's in the impression. So I'm gonna put enhancing nodule. And this is gonna search our entire um, database that we have for all patients with these um, findings in their kind of history. And so this was something he came up with. I don't even know if it's working. It probably logged me out actually. But um, what, what this does is, and he did this, and it was able to do, it sort of looks like it's thinking. It probably logged out though. Anyway, this generates for us an Excel spreadsheet with all of this data that we can export and then use to search. And so that's one way we do it. The other way, and I think this may have also logged me out here, is through PAX. So whatever your PAX vendor is or who your IT is, you can do a search. We can do a pathology search. If your pathologists are an EPIC, you can set this up as well. And so I want to do like, let's say, um, endometriosis and cancer. But I know pathologists don't usually call it that. Let's do something different. Let's do leiomyosarcoma since I can't, I don't want to go through other stuff. So this is searching our pathology database. And so this unfortunately gets a lot of erroneous ones, but it also links me to the imaging. So right away I can see, okay, we've got a bunch of leiomyosarcoma, at least in our pathology. And then what I can do here, and I'm sure you guys, um, you can do this as well, is you can um, then export it. And so you can export that then to your um, home database. Okay. so. Um, back to my PowerPoint here. All right, so then, and, and that's, and we can also do a search of general search tools. All right, and then, so you just need to know how to use search at your institution. EPIC as well allows you to search, and you can set that up with your EPIC um, team members, which is one of the ways um, Encore was able to set us up to get our automatic emails with our pathology reports, just working with the EPIC people, because the information is all there, and you can just enable it to send you this. So this is then study design. And I, Neil taught me this when I was a fellow and it's a great basic outline. So he used to say, before you start, you always go with aims, methods, obstacles. Always start it and fill it out. And so you say, okay, narrow down your idea. Like for example, I'm married to a surgeon. And what was happening was that every time anyone in my group would read a closed loop obstruction, the surgeons would call me to really look at it because they were so sick of people overcalling obstructions that turned out to be just a normal, simple um, small bowel obstruction because nobody wanted to miss a closed loop. They were overcalling it. So, and most residents have learned that, you know, if they're sensitive, the radiologists don't mind it. No radiologists, you know, the classic thing, a weasel under a hedge, you know, eating a waffle. So the legal consequences are big, but the reward for being accurate is increased referral to us. So let's say I want to do an idea like that. So how do I design a study that helps the radiology community stop overcalling closed loops? And so I would say, okay, what makes a suspicion suspect a closed loop? And so I have to go and I say, you know what, I'm going to go to the basic surgical 
journal that my husband uses, which is Current Surgical Diagnosis and Treatment. This is what all the surgeons look at. And they say, you know what, you can't really, you can't tell. And we know lactate is negative in 70% because they can't mount it. And what about physical exam? Well, it can overlap. So then I say, okay, this is not great. And then I go to the OR, what are the findings? And you talk to surgical colleagues. Like, could they potentially miss a closed loop? Like they go in and that, you know, loop of bowel worms out of that adhesion. And now it just, you see some purplish bowel, but they don't see the closed loop. And so you have to say, you know what, actually this is true. Sometimes surgeons can overcall closed loops and sometimes they can't. So it's not a great gold standard, which is why, you know, a lot of people don't like doing surgical research. I learned this later in life because it's just a messy gold standard. But anyway, so we, we say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to get into that. 95% intraop is diagnostic. So then you narrow it down. So you say, you know what? My gold standard is going to be operative exploration, but this is going to bias my results to only the ones that went to the OR, right? So I have now have a selection bias. So for cases that were overcalled, what is the outcome if you don't operate in 24 to 48 hours? So bowel will die, then they're going to die within a week if they're not explored, right? So I'll say, okay, I'll get follow-up then. I will follow up because of that. And so this will catch any ischemic. So I will then say, any patients who weren't operated on as our negative arm, and we will require they are alive at one month after the CT was overcalled and asymptomatic. So we, we will say that. And then what about CT follow-up? Do they ever spontaneous resolve with an NG tube alone? Unlikely. So then we will also include follow-up showing resolution with NG tube placement. And so we can search for all SBOs read as closed loop or internal hernia, and then we do this search. And then we also want to get studies with follow-up within a month, so we do a proximity search, which I had Joe Sanger, our person, develop, which is allows you to search for exams done within a certain time frame. And so then you say, okay, I'm going to now do what Neil said, AIMS methods obstacles. I have imp improved specificity for closed loop imaging as my goal. I'm going to use a feature analysis. I'm going to, and I didn't get into getting the HIPAA and IRB approval. That's a whole nother talk. Um, our IRB luckily is starting to loosen their requirements. Columbia had had a very rational one for years. And so finally, um, I, our IRB is beginning to speed things up so that they guarantee a one month turnaround for projects. Um, especially, I, you know, at, I think at Columbia, they have a blanket radiology IRB, which is essentially um, much easier submission than for things where, you know, you're, you're testing real patients in real time. We're always doing retrospective stuff for the most part. So then I say it's retrospective. We look for all of these cases, red is closed loop, operate with 48, and manage conservatively without complication. This yielded blah, of blah, of which blank were excluded and write down why. And then you say your obstacles are lack of surgical correlation or, or description, lack of IV, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally now, so you've got your projects, how are you going to do your statistics? And they have nice webinars through the AUR Research Alliance. They actually kept them on their site. So for those of you that are in the AUR, or you do a lot of that. They go through a lot of their uh, research. There's also a number of articles in radiographics. And so you essentially always want to keep your stats simple. You want to do like one lesion, one patient. Um, I have a, a, one of my uh, favorite, uh, he was a resident. Now we recruited him on faculty. He's like a master at all the SPSS and uh, the local stats. And he's very helpful in the night before an abstract is due to help generate data. And so, um, oh yes, so back to that. So essentially doing stats, there's a couple of good ways you can do stats. Um, if you don't have SPSS on your site, you can even just do them in Excel. And so, um, I don't even know if I have one of these Excel spreadsheets, but um, very quickly, and I don't even know if it's added here. When you go to the toolbox on your um, home part of Excel, you can actually add in under options, you can do an add in to do uh, research here. So um, yeah, it's slow, but you can go down to your analysis tool pack VBA and you it say go and you uh, you essentially manage it and you say I think you can do I have to hit go yeah so it lets me do all of those so I'll do that and then what's going to pop up is a tool here and then what that will let me do is and I don't know I think I have to start it and close it again. 
but like um, once it once you do that, you can then do a quick. I think that was in here. Once you do it, it should have. I guess it didn't add it under data analysis. Yeah, here. So this now puts that data analysis tool pack there, and it allows you to do like let's do descriptive stats. This will let you generate super quick stats based in this, and that will generate a t-test for you, just simply through Excel. I, and it's beyond the scope to go through it, but it's a very quick and dirty um, thing that everyone has access to simply through your own Excel account. And it generates p-values, which you need for abstracts. And that's, that's very good. When you do the more thorough stats, you can certainly use a better package that's online. Um, the other thing is, you, before you start writing, you want to copy journal requirements. So you want to go to the radiology author toolkit, look at their current requirements or whatever journal you're going to be submitting to and make sure you meet it. Another good thing to do is read like one of these, which radiology has on their site for authors. And it says, these are the top 10 problems in manuscript preparation. They're like, avoid this problem. And I'll tell you, one of the things is you don't put your quantitative data in your advances of knowledge. This one is the biggest one I see everybody make, which is the purpose in the abstract and the purpose in your introduction do not align. This I would put as the number one paid problem. And I think it's because um, people, it's kind of like I've noticed that resident reports they will hedge and say, this may be a hemangioma under like in their report. And then in their impression, they put hemangioma seen in the right lobe. And I don't know what it is about our human nature, but it's like we feel hedgy in one part and then we're more definitive in the other. We cannot be consistent. And this is one of the things I review a number of papers and I'd say half of the papers make this mistake. So you just have to be diligent. You have to mention IRB approval. You have to consider the overlap with prior published studies, which goes back to our design, which is, have people done this? Is this really novel? Or is this something that really doesn't need to be researched? Like, just because you had an idea does not mean it's a novel one that is going to be interesting to people. And the other is, like, look at the STAR guidelines. What are your, you know, did you include all of these? Inclusion, exclusion criteria. Best efficient, you know, if you do two re reader review, JMRI used to accept things all the time that was only one reader. Now everybody wants a kappa. And so it used to be good enough that you are the world expert in this. But if other people can't do it, nobody's interested. And this is AJR. Again, they also do the starred guidelines and they go through and they give you kind of more of a like wordy description of what they want. And so you log on to the site, and I tell the residents this all the time, just go to the site, create a dummy title, and then go and look at the requirements for each section. So if this was, if I was going to go to AJR, I would go to their site and create a fake submission, and then I say, okay, I see, this is what they want. Because the AJR otherwise was too wordy, and I couldn't really see. I want to get actually specifics, like which one is, which, when I do the submission, where does it block me from entering? Oh, I see. It wants me to list, you know, a blind review statement, something like that. So it helps, and this helps residents, and it also takes away some of the fear of creating a journal submission, because you can just fill these in as you go. And this is like divine, des design your data sheet. So when we do, like, let's say I was doing that project on closed loop. So is it closed loop? Is it adhesion? Or was it presumed adhesion? And so you say, okay, I'm going to put the date, modality, size, reader one, what was their gestalt? One or two? Yes, no. Reader, was there a U-shaped sign, which was previously? Yes, no. Okay, one, two, three. And then fluid in the loop? Yes, no, proximal. And so this is going to be my binary system of evaluating. And I know there's a five here. I, this was just made up. So uh, essentially, this is going to help Either if you're going to hire a statistician or if you're going to do it yourself, it's going to help to have that thing. And then finally, like your readers are never going to want to go back and look at something you forgot to have them look at the first time. So be very sure you're analyzing everything when you send your database out. Like don't say, oh, guys, I actually, sorry, this isn't really showing well. I'd rather you look at this um, C-shaped sign. So can you go back to the 500 patients and redo it? They're not going to do it. And so you really want to make sure you're doing everything very thorough, win it. And one of the good ways to do this, you create a testing set and you can work out the problems then. 
And then finally, if you're going to do two reader review, I know it's not hard hitting research, but you want to find two readers who are accurate and fast and they're able to turn around the data within one to two months. And they're willing to put the observations directly into the Excel spreadsheet as they read. Because uh, people that require that you print out all the sheets and enter it, that's a whole nother step of delay. And then essentially what we've discovered that uh, reviewers will accept generally as a, enough time to forget. Let's say you nobody wants to work on your dumb project because they're like, oh, you keep coming up with these bad ideas and nothing gets accepted. So then nobody's willing to be a reader on your project. So you have to collect the data and you have to be the reader. So generally, uh, most reviewers, including radiology, accept a six week time period as a wait between reading and reviewing as enough time to forget about it. So you can put that in your materials and methods and they'll accept that. And you just have to harass them. Andy Rosencrantz is the world's best harasser at getting people to complete things. Um, so I've learned how, how to harass people from him. All right, and, and this is meant in all praise. All right, and so finally, it is quicker to avoid having readers and do projects without readers, which a lot of people in my group have discovered, which is um, why quality papers are getting to be more um, interesting. It's a lot more interesting to do some are quick observational studies, looking at analysis of adherence to published guide, guidelines in real-time reads. So you say, you know what, I'm not going to do a two-reader retrospective review. I'm going to look at TIRADS and I'm going to pull all the data from our group and see how effective TIRADS was in our group. And studies like that get into radiology if they're broad enough. You just have to manage a lot of data. Um, and so it, you can do health data mining. So this is actually an easier method um, that doesn't rely on the two-reader classical retrospective review. Let's say you're still well, doing you, a two-reader retrospective. Yes. Can you go back to that slide and just, wait, so how do you do this again? Oh, how to do these studies? I mean, I'll <laughs> tell you, Andy is the, the like genius at doing these studies, but essentially you would do then, you would go through your re, so you would then, like, let's say I'm doing TIRADS. I will then pool all cases of TIRADS and I would either have a pathology, but I would take my group, I would say, we are a radiology group that employs 20 subspecialized body ultrasound readers, along our subspecialized readers. Uh, we looked at the accuracy of TIRADS four categories. So we prospectively as a group read a TIRADS and we assign it. I just gather our model groups data and I look at how good we were, was our TIRADS for uh, aligning with a 20% malignancy rate. In fact, our TIRADS for aligns with a 0.01% malignancy rate. Um, and I only know this because the cytopathologists were making fun of me the other day, uh, along with our group's woesome accuracy with TIRADS. So, I'm just, I'm just saying, so then you would, obviously I would not, I would not submit this paper to any journal because it would humiliate my section. But let's say this is a study you want to do and you feel like you're doing a good job with it. Then you would actually want to go through and say, you know what, we're pretty good at TIRADS for, or is it a problem with our group or is it a problem with TIRADS? And so, and then you just pull it and then you look at that data in real time. If you're interested in the studies that look at that, um, you would go to radiology and uh, or one of the papers and just I think AJR had one recently and you look at what their seem, um, it doesn't seem that much yes. more complicated than the other studies. Right. Oh, so you're saying the two reader review. You're saying this is just as tedious as oh. doing the two reader retrospective review. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just saying this seems easier. No, no, I'm saying this is yeah, this is easier. Okay. So that, that's my point is like, for example, it's very hard for me to recruit residents and fellows to retrospectively capture all of the data that has like, you know, closed loop obstruction and then take that data and put it in a, a sheet and then organize all everything we want them to analyze and then send it out to two radiologists in my group to generate reads for two months. And then I got to go do Kappa analysis on it. And then I have to sort of say, okay, am I going to go with 
both of them for discordant reads. I'm going to have them do consensus, and then you create a single one and a single chart, or like AGR sometimes wants you to do two charts. That's very tedious. Instead, and you know, I've noticed more and more papers are coming out where people are like, we just took our prospective groups reads and we threw it into this database and we, you know, we don't have a kappa. We don't care because they all looked at it in real time. What's interesting also as an aside on that was if you are using prospective reads, can you call that a prospective study? And of course, the answer is no, because in order to actually call it a prospective study officially like it was a prospective design, you must have met with your IRB and you must have met all of the requirements of setting up of how patients meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria before rolling it out. So you can't just say, I'm taking my um, institution's reads because we read everything prospectively with a TIRAD, so it was a pr prospective study. It doesn't work like that. You actually have to kind of set your inclusion exclusion criteria, get it approved, and then you can call it a prospective study, and then it's much more powerful, obviously. So anyways, and then while readers are working, write the paper, and so that's the hardest part, right? Because where do all the residents drop off the planet? It's after they've flown out to the meeting, right? And they've gone to Hawaii or wherever it is and presented. And then you cannot get them to write the paper because it's tedious. And also, in reality, residents writing paper requires a lot of work to overdo it. Most of the resident first level submissions uh, are like they're teaching a medical student about a phenomenon and it's too dumbed down to be respectful to submit to a journal. So you have to actually tell them, guys, this is, this is not going to fly. Like you can't just give me CME on my like introduction. You have to raise the level of sophistication. And then unfortunately that involves teaching them what are the current literature? What are the heavy hitting seminal papers? What is the question we're asking? And we really need to have respect for our audience. Let's say I'm writing it a subspecialty thing on Bosniak cysts. I'm not gonna say the Bosniak cystic classification, it, 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 it involves with Bosniak one is this, Bosniak two is this, Bosniak two F is this. You have to say, you have to start at a higher level and say, you know, as we know, there have been multiple revisions to the Bosnian criteria. The current version 2019 proposes, you know, measurements replacing Gestalt. Is this effective? And then you move on into that. And so it kind of you have to start at a higher level. And that is the problem. And that's something residents struggle with. And it's very hard to overwrite papers. But that is the meat of the study. And so before you begin, you should be able to write most of them and you need to have written this while they're doing it. And the best thing about this is when the data comes, then you don't need to kind of drag your feet about this because it's like writing a term paper. And so we already know our objectives like here, which we did before was we wanted to do this feature analysis. We retrospectively involved this. We are, you know, we know what time frame we did the research from and we excluded included for this yielding blank studies and blank patients. Our limitations, we already know because we set it up knowing our limitations. Um, and so, you know, and then you have to argue, you have to kind of say why this limitation doesn't kill your study. And so, you know, this is my rationale for it. And we didn't look at all SBOs um, for distinguishing the different types beyond the scope of this study. We could consider doing this in the future. And then you write like that. Finally, at the end, I, and I did take the full time, I'm a, I apologize, but um, quick tips for figures. So one thing you should always know is no one's going to ever reject a paper because your figure wasn't pretty. And I remember when I did my fellowship under um, Neil and Yvonne, they are such purists that they would make me go to Adobe Photoshop and use the DICOM. And I dreaded this. It took me forever. So like here, like I would go to like Adobe Photoshop. And, and the other thing is a lot of people don't even have Adobe Photoshop. So you have this like expensive program and they would have me go in, add layers, drop the like arrow. It was gorgeous, but it would take me like weeks to get my figures up to quality. And so the bottom line, then I learned when I got here, that was totally unnecessary because your paper may get rejected and then you're going to feel so angry about it. So the easier thing to do for like a paper 
like let me see if I have a quick quick image that I can pull but um like if I go to my um, if I'm going to something I'll just use this so here's I, I want to submit something super fast from put in this See. All right, so let's say I'm doing this. This was like a case. So I, I, I want to put this as my paper. And I'll say, you know what, this is the figure I want. All I have to do is get one of these like screenshot programs, or you can even just right click, save as picture. And then I say, you know what, I'm just going to save this. And they said it has to be a TIFF, let's say coronal haze figure. And I just save this quickly. And now I've got it saved. It's on my desktop somewhere. And I'll just pull that in to the paper. Um, it's not showing up right now because my desktop is too busy. But did essentially you that, that- Did you pull that image as a snippet? Yeah, you can do it as a snippet. I just did it real quick. It's just a, um, I right clicked, actually, sorry. No, but I mean, even to get it into that PowerPoint, you pulled it from your packs as what? A, a TIFF, a JPEG, or a snippet? I did a snip. I did a snippet, but you. I could also have done it as an export as DICOM. But I'll tell you, no one in the journal is looking at the quality of your studies, right? Of your images, like to see is it meeting your, you know, 550 by 550 DPI, like that they requested. Nobody's looking at that. They're just looking to see is your study worthwhile. So before you start like pulling stuff, and sometimes they're going to say that your your images you have too many images or this is not showing what we wanted it to say. And so for you to spend a ton of time reformatting this is a waste of your time and it's a waste of everyone's time. So I just would just quickly insert um, a cheap shot image into your paper and let it look as bad as it's supposed to be. Like, um, I don't know, did I, that's not, I guess it didn't, where is it? I, I screenshot it. Save as, let's this one, save as picture. Oh, I see, I put in the wrong place, desktop. I'll say quick. And I, like, let's say it's supposed to be a TIFF. So then you save it like that, and then you go to your last page. It's, here it is, quick TIFF. So I pull it in, that's my paper. And like, let's say, oh, you know what? I want an arrow. So instead of me spending all of this time doing those perfect Photoshop arrows, I'll say, I'm gonna do this. That's gonna be my arrow. And that's going to be it. And they're going to say, oh, you need to have it labeled as a figure. So then I'll say, okay, insert text, text box, and I'll say 1A. That's that. And then I just quickly like reformat my font to be like 1A. And now, and I didn't even do that right. So then now I've got it. So then I do this again, and then I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to do another one of these screenshots, or I can group them all together, group, 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 and then I say group together, and then I just say save as picture again, right? And now I've got my quick pick, and I'll say it's a TIFF, and I submit it. No, none of the police that care about this are going to do anything about it. Now I've got my picture with the arrow, and I can submit it. That's it. And so what's going to happen is when it's time, if it's actually accepted, someone from the depart someone from the paper is going to say, these pictures do not meet our standards. You need to re-upload that. Then it is worthwhile for me to actually go through and get them to the quality that I want to represent my institution. But don't ever let a figure bog you down otherwise, because it's just a waste of time and it's one of those other steps that's just going to hold you back from submission. And so kind of that's that's like uh, that's kind of what I would say. And so when you actually are going to start submitting it for like, let's say you have a radiographics article, then you're going to have to actually go through Adobe Photoshop or not. Like I, I have people in my group that have no pride about the quality of the images they submit to the journal. And a lot of the journals will accept, you know, a, you know, a lower quality TIFF. It's kind of your pride. Um, I, like I said, Neil, like made me feel bad if I didn't have the highest image quality. So I actually tend to go through this very tedious process with Adobe Photoshop for it. So I guess to just conclude, we have a research, um, we have a research PhD who helps us do statistics. And so, you know, I often will tell people 
why don't you just schedule a meeting with the researcher and see how he like thinks so you can see if you want him to help you with your grant submission, your database submission. And often they'll explain like what they complain about, what they don't like, and they'll give you dummy Excel like formats that they want you to submit their research to. Or here, I think SPSS software is a nice tool. Um, you know, some people prefer to download, you know, a math lab or stuff from the net to do their research, or you can even just do Excel research if it's simple research. Um, but this is a nice one. The problem with SPSS is it has a high learning curve to learn how to enter data because you have to sign like qualitative, quantitative for each role. But if you, if you, once you learn it, what is hardest about this is data entry. What's easiest is you just do right click and say, run a two-tailed t-test and it spits out all the data for you and so that, that's a nice one and then finally like sometimes people i will say like if you think your paper can get into radiology it has a fast two-week turnaround and then you get good feedback about study design and you can incorporate those changes and submit to the next journal on your list now i gave this talk to a bunch of our researchers and they said i was abusing reviewers for radiology by recommending that i submit my, you know, my crappy study. And I was like, listen, I was like, I don't actually think my study is crappy when I'm submitting it to radiology. I'm hoping it gets in. And they, they thought I was like just recommending abusing the system, <laughs> which is not what I'm recommending. If you have a horrible study that you know is only going to get into at best, you, you know, you, the Uzbekistan journal of, you know, cats and dogs or something, like just don't, don't waste your time submitting it somewhere else. But um, if you actually think you're going to get some good feedback and you have a half chance of getting in, then it's worth it to do it. So that's that. That's my last slide. Sorry. Well, that was amazing. And if I didn't have myself muted, you would have heard me laughing, <laughs> which is the bad part about Zoom. You don't hear all the reactions, but that was like and oh. a lot of, uh, comments in the, in the chat box that this was really awesome, really helpful. And you're super funny. So thank you. Oh, well, yes. No, thanks so much. And so uh, is, is that it? Are we done? Yeah, there was one question that came up and if anybody else, there's like lots of thank yous coming up, lots of great tips. Um, but uh, one question that we that we skipped was about co-authorship. Does that mean anything oh. for like promotion? Like, like if you're, can you be like co-first authors or like what does second author mean if the resident a trainee is a first author? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, here we only get um, what counts for us is first, second, or fifth for promotion. However, what I've started to learn is they've started decreasing the authorship requirements because, frankly, as everyone's gotten so much clinically busier than ever before, and academics has melded to be a pseudo private practice at a lot of places. Um, and there are private practices that are very much like academic centers, and the line is less easy to draw. I've noticed, at least at NYU, they have loosened the promotion requirements, and actually they still are just looking for that denominator. So like having 100 publications, they do ask when you go up to list your most hard-hitting first author publications. And so, yes, it is important to have first author publications. Um, someone once gave me a number. It's a good idea when you're starting out to aim to get three publications a year. Any authorship, just three a year would be a great goal for like being super productive and it doesn't have to be amazing journals, but they were saying that's a good number. And then over time, you want to start being able to have some first author as you learn how to do it. Um, you 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 get quicker at it and then you can get a better publication but in terms of it for us and I know Cornell I think is the same way in New York City it's first second or fifth but I would say it doesn't actually I've noticed a lot more people in my group getting promoted with um, just middle authorship and then there is something valuable to be said for being a middle author on a paper because what you do is you build networks with people and the other thing i didn't put in here was um, a savvy move is to start publishing with clinicians in your institution because like for example surgeons at my institution believe that everyone should be on a paper like and i, agree. So it's, I don't i yeah i don't i don't promote like phantom authorship but like they're much more collegial about sticking everyone's name on it so if you put a surgeon's name who helped you on your paper they will very quickly return the favor with you and yeah, put I, you on um, more of 
I sometimes like will just even like advise the urology residents on like how do you read MRIs and like which sequence should you pick for your study and like how do you navigate through MRIs, right? And then they'll put me on yeah. all the papers that came out of that. And then I'll be like available for consultation whenever they have issues about their sarcopenia study. But um, it does, yeah, and I, sometimes I felt a little bad about it, but I was like, well, I did do something. And then it makes up for all the times in my earlier years where I was like basically taken, you know, lost my first no, it, because of some weird situation. So I'm like, okay, I guess it's all karma. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'll tell you, this whole first authorship thing was, it's, it is um, probably the biggest unspoken um, like elephant in the room with researchers. All of us were burned early on in life when we did research and people told us, you need to get first author. You need to get first author. And you see people getting first author because they're doing research with an older attending who just doesn't care. And they didn't deserve the first authorship versus you were slugging through stuff and you were working with a junior attending and it wasn't clear at first. And you thought each of you would get a paper with first author. And then it turns out, you know, um, it, it didn't work out like that. And so, um, you know, and then, then the problem is you, you carry this around and you're like, you remember this bad experience where you invested your life blood into something and you kind of walked away feeling like you didn't get the recognition you deserved on it. And I think, unfortunately, that now is like just every single person I know coming out has that story. Sometimes, sometimes it's true. Sometimes there's two sides to every story. And sometimes the person did do a lot of tedious research, but they didn't have the sophistication to write the paper. And so, unfortunately, it's, again, the person who writes the paper is officially the person who deserves first authorship. And so, and that's what's so frustrating for junior people. But you're right. If you can do work with easier things, like, I, and I think surgery literature is a lot easier to get in than radiology literature a lot of times. They've got a lot more journals. Um, and, like, it, medicine is harder a lot of times, right? Like, to get New England Journal or one of their heavy hitting, they want you to collect a ton of, you know, clinical data. And so, it, it, that is another venue to try and um, kind of increase. But, but in general, working, um, you know, reaching out across, you know, the divide, inviting your collaborators in, that will serve you well um, a lot in the future. Awesome. I have a philosophical question. Are you, yeah. um, so it sounds like you love doing research or have loved doing research. As you progress in your career and you get busier with administrative stuff, do you find a way to still do it? And like, are you still energized about it? Or are you, how are you feeling? Well, listen, I'm still not very, my biggest passion with doing research is actually in training the younger people than I am into not making my mistakes that I made kind of coming up and not knowing how to start. So I try to be like, you know, my father's a mathematician, he's a grad student advisor, and he essentially is trained in mathematics. There's no such thing as first author, it's alphabetical. And so no one really cares about the authorship, everything is alphabetical. And he just gives away his ideas to his grad students so that they can get their PhD theses and move on. And by doing that, you know, he has helped to train an army load of, um, you know, black mathematicians throughout the country. And it's a source of great pride for my father. And I think similarly for me, one of the great things and pleasures is that, okay, I know I'm not going to get an NIH grant at this stage of my life. Or I, I'm, you know, in theory, it could happen like some R21 or some small thing, but it's impossible for people who are doing well to get them now, right? It's like the competition is greater, they're defunded, et cetera, et cetera. So what I prefer to do, though, is to have my residents have the thrill of coming up with an idea of contributing to the you know, national conversation and helping to like move the compass on policies and how we do things and find that exciting. So I right now, almost all my research is training people junior to me. It is a headache. It is super painful to read like introductions that show a incomplete grasp of the well, current, you know. Well done. I'm just kidding. <laughs> What's that? I said there are residents. I know there are residents. I know, I say this to my residents. 
<laughs> I'm I'm a very very afrontal lobia person. I love my residents, and I, I'm tell I tell this to them. I tell this to my kids. I'm a mean mommy, and I, I I they can listen because they need to hear it. Because honestly, they're tougher than we give them credit for, and they like it. What I didn't realize is they love that feedback. I mean, you have to keep in mind these are kids that went to the hardest, you know, high schools, Westinghouse all these competitions, math teams, where they got their head ripped off by cutthroat competitors. They are tough and they're ready to handle tough criticism on their writing and they love it. That's another thing I wasn't prepared for. They can take criticism very well and they wanna learn, but they just need people to be willing to do it for them. And so anyway, that's what I'm doing. And, like, um, and, and that gives me pleasure. And so that's kind of my motivation for doing research. So that, that's kind of where I stand. So I, don't, I certainly don't see, and as I take on more administration, I think almost everybody who's in administration, first love is the clinical and the research, right? Yeah, that was, wow, I loved that little last, like, <laughs> um, speech about resilience. That was, that's amazing. And um, yeah, I'm, your, your residents are lucky to have you. If I, I, I feel like I wish I'd learned all this stuff like years ago, so. Yeah, no, it's the same for me. I learned it the hard way and I'm still learning and I just hope to get catch them when they're young enough to be able to like make a bigger impact. But anyways, yeah. Awesome. Okay. It's a little after the hour, so I'm gonna let people go back to yeah. work. Nicole, thank you so much. That was amazing. It was recorded. It will yeah. be posted. And uh, okay. I'm gonna watch it again because um I didn't catch it all, but it was amazing. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Oh, stop.